Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Today we're taking a look again at stepper motor calculations. The first time I did this, I did make quite a number of errors. So, although there were some, some things that I got right, most of it was not well judged. So, let's just start from scratch. We'll try again with a slightly better method and hopefully this will get us a better result. In this video, we're just going to be looking at the equations, how we form the equations and making sure we have the right equations set. And then from that, we're going to take a look at getting it all set up in Excel, putting in some rough values and then getting a result at the end. So there are a couple of things that we need to sort out in order to work this out. Most of it revolves around this. So we have three main characteristics here. The torque, which is like the force, which is the rotational strength of the motor. Uh, inertia is an object's resistance to movement as a result of its mass. And alpha is rotational acceleration. There are a couple of concepts through this calculation that might be new to you, such as this sort of thing and rotational acceleration. But I'll try and cover them in depth enough so you know what's going on. But I'm not going to be explaining everything from scratch. So this torque breaks down into two things, the acceleration torque and the load torque. The sum of those two torques will give us the torque we need for the motor. So the motor torque is your acceleration torque plus the load torque. We also add in a safety factor here, but we'll come to that at the end. So you have your acceleration torque and your load torque. To find your acceleration torque, you need, again, a couple more things. We have two inertias. We have the inertia of the load, which is the inertia of the, the moving components. And I naught is the inertia of the rotor, so the, the moving part of the stepper motor. Uh, we also need to multiply that by a gear ratio I, and that needs to be squared. And then all of that is multiplied by alpha, our rotational acceleration. So what we've done here is basically uh, taken this general equation and made it more specific to the instance for load torque, uh, acceleration torque rather. And we've taken this I and expanded it into this. This alpha is still the same alpha. For the load torque, we will derive it in a moment, but for now I'll just write it as mu, which is the uh, friction coefficient, times m, the mass of the object, times g, gravity, times r, the radius of the pulley, all over n, which is the system efficiency, times i, which again is the gear ratio. So those are the equations that we're going to use. Let's take a look at uh, how we can get to this and how these work. So the first thing we want to find is this, i, l, the inertia of the load, which is quite an easy thing to find. So in general, for around a point, if you have a distance r and to a point mass m, the inertia of that mass around that point is i, which is equal to the mass m times the radius squared. So that's a point mass. It has no sort of volume or anything. It's just a single infinitesimally small point that has a mass. In this instance, we're going to be looking at the specific uh, load case for a a stepper motor which has on a pulley and is driving a belt. So the belt goes on one side and off the other side as a result of the rotation of the pulley. In this case we can still use this infinitesimally small mass because it's basically like an infinitesimally small surface which is the belt. For I naught this is the rotor inertia. Basically the rotor's natural resistance to motion. It should be a fairly small value because it's just the motor itself. It's not attached to anything. Uh, but it's a value you're going to need to look up because it will be specific to each motor. So this is why you have to have a sort of iterative calculation here because you'll need to put in a, an estimate value, then go and find stepper motors that are close to it, put those values in and see what that comes to. And that should that process should get you close to where you need to be. But the rotor of inertia for a NEMA 17 oops, can't spell again, NEMA 17, is either about 57 
or I think they go up to 75 or something, and then there's one at like 120. And this basically, if you know what the edge of a stepper motor looks like, you have your spindle sticking out here, your rotor on the inside, with all your magnets and things in, and then you have some screws coming in here and here and here and this sort of mounting face here. Uh, and this mass will depend on the length L of the motor. As the length gets longer, its rotational inertia will also increase. So this is for a sort of lower torque motor, and this is for a higher torque motor. So looking back at our first equation, we're getting quite close to what we need. We've got I L, we would have I naught, and we just need I squared now and alpha. For I, I is the gear ratio. So this is the difference between your input rotation and your output rotation. Uh, it's the way you can calculate it is the output teeth divided by the input teeth. So if you had, say, two gears that were meshed together, one had 10 teeth, the other had 20 teeth, this one is being driven, and this one, no, this one is being driven and this one is driving. So this is your input, your input is 10, and your output is 20. So your gear ratio is 20 over 10, cancel the zeros, two over one, which is two. I've just realized here that we missed finding R. So finding R for a pulley is quite easy. You need a couple of things, literally two things. You need to know the number of teeth and the pitch of the teeth. So say, for example, we have 20 teeth and the pitch is two millimeters. The effective circumference, so the distance all the way around, which is, you know, the full circle, would be two times 20, which is 40 millimeters. And then to get that to the radius, you divide it by two pi. So for this example, 40 divided by two times pi give you 6.36. So I've sort of made these values up, but you can plug in your own numbers there. And that radius then is 6.36 millimeters. So we're doing quite well. Now we just need alpha. Alpha is more of a conversion of rotational acceleration to linear acceleration. So for our printer, we know our acceleration is gonna be a set value. We'll have a set maximum because we'll put it in the firmware. For, for argument's sake, let's just say 1,000 millimeters per second squared. That's our linear acceleration or linear maximum acceleration in the printer firmware. To turn this into a rotational acceleration, we need it in radians per second squared. So alpha is something in radians per second squared. For those that don't know, in a full circle, all the way around you have two pi radians. So in a half a circle, you have pi radians. In a quarter of the circle, you have pi over two radians. So it's just a, it doesn't matter what size the circle is, the rotation, the amount of rotation is still the same. So because we're now dealing with circles, we're gonna need some properties of the circle. And the best way to do this is to use the circumference of the circle, which we calculated over here. So we know it's the number of three, 20 times the pitch of two millimeters. And that gives you a 40 millimeter circumference. From that 40 millimeter circumference, we can then do our target. So this is a linear distance. We, this is sort of linear as well. So we have a thousand divided by 40. And then we need to times that by two pi to convert it to radians. And that will give us our radians per second. So that gives us 157 radians to minus two. Or you can call it radians per second squared. It's exactly the same thing. So on the first line, we've got everything we need now. Well, we would if we actually put values in, but these are the equations. So for I L, we've got this. For I naught, we've got this. For I squared, we've got this. And for alpha, we've got this. When we put this all into Excel, we'll be able to put numbers in and find an actual value. Let's take a look now, whoopsie daisy. Let's take a look at this load torque. Effectively what you've got, simplifying the system down to something that we can resolve a lot easier. We basically have a mass M on a surface. 
that is being pulled by a string, rod, belt, not rod, a string slash belt by a pulley. A pulley with radius R. Uh, applies torque tau. This has a resistive motion, a resistive force of friction and has gravity. So the friction force, little f, is uh, mass times gravity times the friction coefficient. Now the friction coefficient is a property of the material on material contact, so it's dependent on both sides. Uh, this is where we're looking at the difference between an LM8UU or something like an eye guess bushing. So to give you an idea, LM8UU, if I remember correctly, is about 0.002 and uh, an eye guess bushing is in the region of 0.2. So you can see there's quite a significant difference in the friction coefficient of these materials, but this is for a what you call a proper LM8UU, not a Chinese one, which will undoubtedly be less good. But these are just sort of approximate values. Obviously, each Argus bushing is different, and each element you, you bought from different places will probably be slightly different as well. This is assuming we're in contact with a steel rod. And then the reason we need to find F is we can now resolve this force and this force this way. So this force is a result of tau, the torque, and we can find the torque needed here. So the tau torque is basically like calculating moments. If you've ever done moments, it's a force around a pivot or fulcrum, I think they call it in America. So it's basically, we call this F, so it's that force, the pulling force that resists friction, or we can just call it a little F because that's the only friction, the only motion it's resisting, uh, times little r, the radius of the pulley, which we already calculated from elsewhere. And then we also need to divide that by the system efficiency, eta, times the gear ratio i. Again, we've calculated our gear ratio already, and eta, we already have a set value of 90%, let's say. It could be 85 to 95 approximately. We don't know exactly until we measure our own system, but an approximate value will be good enough. Now, if we want to simplify this down, we've got this little f and this little f. We can make this into one nice big equation for torque load, which, as we can put air, as we showed earlier, it looks like this. But we get that by substituting this m g mu into where that f is times r over eta times i and that gives you tau load equals mu m g r over eta i so now you know how we get to that from that what values influence it and why it happens that way so from there all we need to do is plug those into this. So this is the motor torque times, well, the motor torque is the sum of the acceleration torque and the load torque multiplied by a safety factor. A safety factor is probably less important here, but it's basically, it allows for things like real life scenarios where not everything is exactly perpendicular and things like that. But in this case, it's not that critical. And at the end of the day, we're very unlikely to find the exact stepper motor of the exact torque we need. We're more likely to find one that's just slightly more than what we want. So to do this, we're going to use a safety safety factor of, say, 1.5, which will be plenty for us. And then we can just sum them up. So torque for the motor is the torque for acceleration, which we already calculated through this, plus the load torque and then times both of them by 1.5. And that will give you the torque needed for your motor. You can then go and find that motor somewhere in a shop that has the right torque rating and input your rotor inertia and make sure that all your calculations are right. So there you have it. That's my semi-educated assumption on how to calculate the low torque needed for a stepper motor in a 3D printer where the stepper motor is driving a belt with uh, bearings, bushings on rails. This calculation will obviously change where you have something like a, uh, a ball screw or a lead screw where you have an inclined plane and everything's basically being pushed up or downhill. But 
that doesn't matter for this immediately. This is just for belt driven systems on 3D printers. So that's now everything for my estimated calculation for stepper motors. Uh, I'm going to go away now and put this into a spreadsheet and see if I can find some reasonable values that are reasonably close to reasonable price stepper motors that I can use for Steve Mark II. If you do choose to use this, I'll have a link below for the spreadsheet where you can uh, copy it to your own Google account and then you can modify it how you like. So, thank you very much for watching. Uh, hopefully I'll see you in the next video for the Steve Mark II design. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter if you want to. Leave a like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.